My name is Ranga Srinivasan, and uh, today I'll be talking about uh, a new software called Axon Tracker 3D. This software can be used to label individual axons in the neuromuscular junction connectome. Uh, connectome is another term um, to describe the complete connectivity of the neuronal components. So, briefly today's uh, talk, I'll, I'll go through a short introduction to the uh, field of neurobiology and uh, uh, what are the re recent developments in this area. And followed by uh, the overall goals of the project and how Axon Tracker 3D, um, using Axon Tracker 3D, we can achieve that. And also, uh, uh, I will conclude the presentation using uh, some summarizing statements and also some improvements that we have planned for the future. As most of us know, uh, it all began with the work of Dr. Santiago Cajal. Uh, when he used silver staining technique uh, to isolate a few neuro uh, neurons. And with this, he was able to uh, study the structure and the connectivity of the, uh, of, of, of the neural components. And it was his pioneering work in uh, the earlier circuit analysis that uh, led, the, led to the foundations of uh, the modern neurobiology. Following this, there were um, a couple of interesting discoveries one of them being uh, uh, doc Dr. Hitzig and Dr. Gustav uh, stimulated the brains of live dogs. And uh, with the exposed brains, they, what they found was that there were specific areas of the brain which, when stimulated, uh, could control the actual bodily functions. And uh, in 1940s, Dr. Penfield mapped the, uh, mapped the whole motor cortex uh, using a similar idea. Uh, where he used uh, the brains of epilepsy patients and found that by exciting certain areas of the brain, he could actually trigger an uh, entire sequence of memories. And these were some of the discoveries which actually led man to be inspired to learn more about how the brain works and how the CNS actually works. Uh, this is one of the recent developments at the Harvard University where um, at Dr. Lich's lab, they were able to uh, they were able to get the entire connectome and to be able to label each neuron with a specific color. So this technique actually works uh, very similar to how we see colors on a, on a television screen. So by using different combinations of red, green, and blue colors, we're able to see uh, thousands of different colors. So by using, uh, similarly by using different combinations of the fluorescent proteins, they were able to label uh, individual neurons with different colors. So why do we want to study uh, the neuron connectome uh, at all? So first and foremost, uh, it is believed to be the starting point, a very good starting point to, uh, to study the details of the CNS. So by uh, solving the entire circuit, by isolating the neurons, uh, we can actually get uh, the morphological features which are believed to be directly related to their functional properties. and. Uh, also, by looking at how these connectomes are formed over time, we can actually uh, uh, we can see how the neural circuits develop. And some of the potential applications is in the study of psychiatric disorders, such as schizophrenia, in which by looking at um, two different connect connectomes, by looking at the differences between them in the normal and the disease mouse model, uh, neurobiologists can actually determine whether these differences have any direct impact on the disease itself. Or for testing new drugs, um, by doing a time series analysis, we can see whether the drug is actually working or not by looking at the differences. So um, the data acquired uh, in this study, uh, uh, they were acquired from uh, transgenic mice which ex express YFP in their cytoplasm. And uh, the laser scanning microscope was used uh, which had a motorized stage. What this means was that the entire connectome was not taken out of, uh, taken as a snapshot. It was taken in bits and pieces. So we have data that are adjacent to each other, and there was a variable overlap left between them intentionally so that later on we can put them together and look at the big picture. So these are the overall goals. Uh, the goal was to label individual axons. Although the axons are easy to look at, uh, easy to see um, because they have a dark background, but it's dif it's difficult to actually differentiate between uh, each one of them. So we wanted to label individually and to be able to uh, separate them uh, from one another. 
And finally, when all the data sets have been traced and have been analyzed, um, we wanted to stitch them together to form uh, the collage and also to obtain the morphological features to study how, how they span over the 3D space. The main hurdles that we uh, faced in this, uh, in doing so, is the intensity and non-uniformity. This was the single most biggest hurdle we faced. Uh, the neurons, were, the axons would not express similar intensity. They would have a drastic change in intensity over very, very short duration, of, uh, very, very short lengths, which means that we would see uh, uh, neurons appear and disappear randomly in the data set. Um, and also there would be unpredictable branching and also the orientation change. And we also had very close running axons which looked like they were touching together. And, uh, you know, and it was hard to manually differentiate between them. Um, so there are a few available softwares which could potentially be used uh, to solve this. For example, there was the Reconstruct Amaris Neuron J which could be used to trace the center lines of the axons. But the main drawback uh, that we found was that uh, they either operate on the maximum intensity projection image, which is a 2D image, or a sequence of the 2D images. So in case there's a, there's a drastic change in orientation, it's, it's really hard to actually uh, track them efficiently. There are other algorithms which have been proposed in literature for um, tracking tubular objects. For example, there's template matching where uh, a predefined template is used uh, to find the boundaries of the objects and also array-based sampling uh, which uses, um, uh, which projects rays from a given point to find the edges. Uh, the problem in our case is so different from the problems proposed in the literature that these algorithms really cannot be used directly uh, to solve this application. So uh, this is the workflow, basic workflow of the axon tracker that we have. Uh, the incoming image is first pre-processed and we compute the candidate centers. What this means is that uh, we actually define whether a voxel in a given data set belongs to a center line or not. And this is followed by an interactive tracking procedure. This means that uh, the user needs to click uh, the starting point for each axon, and the algorithm takes over after that. Uh, but if there's a problem in tracking, the user can actually guide it and correct it. Once all the tracking has been done for all the data sets, we need to merge them together to form the complete collage. So for pre-processing, uh, we use an anisotropic diffusion filter. The specialty of this filter is that it removes noise while it preserves the sharpness of the image. This is important because the axons are very close lying and at the boundaries the contrast is, uh, is already very low. And an interactive tracking procedure, which I will be talking more uh, in the coming slides, uh, involves, uh, involves an algorithm known as the gradient vector flow. And by using the results from the interactive tracking, we can uh, segment the data sets. We can segment the axons, individual axons, and label them. So uh, for this, uh, this step is actually called a scoring method uh, in which each voxel, for each voxel we say whether this voxel belongs to the center line or it doesn't. So uh, this method uses, uh, this uh, step uses a method called as the gradient vector flow method. Uh, originally, this was proposed to guide the um, active contours method uh, to conform to the actual boundary so that the objects could be segmented. But we have used it here in an inverse manner. So we take the original image, we binarize them, and we get an overall boundary of the object. And once we have that, uh, we take the GBF forces and we collapse these um, boundaries to their center point. So once we do the non-maximum non suppression to remove sp uh, spurious points, uh, we can get in the study image uh, the approximate center, center points for all the axons present here. So uh, the main drawback here is that uh, this method, oh, I'm sorry if you cannot see that. Uh, the main drawback is that this method works in 2D. So 
we have done this in uh, all three dimensions, which is the x, y, and z directions. So we take the cross-sectional images along the x, y, and z. So if you notice here, uh, the scoring method is, uh, it is reliable for objects. If it is done in the vertical direction, it is reliable for objects that are oriented only in the vertical direction. But if they are horizontal, it's, it's not so. And similar case is in the, uh, you can see in the horizontal and in the z direction. So what we want to do is combine them together so that this can be defined for an object which is oriented in any random given direction. So in order to do so, we take the original data, we divide them into smaller blocks. And in each of these smaller blocks, we compute the uh, orientation of the object present in it. And once we get that vector, we take the components of those along the x, y, and z directions, and we add them together. So now, using these three scores, we can compute, we can get the scores for, uh, the, we can get a unified score for the whole data set, which defines whether the voxels belong to a center line or not. And once that is done, uh, the tracking process actually begins, which first uh, starts off with the user clicking the initial point for, initial or a seed point for uh, each of the axons. Once this is done, um, the algorithm takes it from there and computes the rest of the center line for, for each of the axons. Now, at each step, you have to compute what is, what is the next center line going to be. So there's a search which can be thought of as a, a ball moving through, this, through a tube along its center. So at each step, we have to, we are, a search is performed where we try to find voxels which belong to the center line. So once, um, in case, uh, okay, this is the case where many points are found. For example, more than one point is found. So if more than one is found, we try to minimize this function, which, is, uh, which involves a gradient uh, component and a directional component. The gradient component is the cost of moving from point A to point B and how much gradient it, it is encountering. And also the, the direction um, component of this function is to minimize the, uh, the directional vectors between point A and point B. So in case there is any problem tracking, if none of, no points are found at all, then uh, manual intervention can be used where the user can guide the algorithm and uh, after clicking a few points, then the algorithm can uh, move on. So to summarize the tracking process, we have the original data followed by the x, y, and z, like I've shown, and the unified uh, scoring method. And this is a result of, uh, it's not very visible, I'm sorry. Uh, but this is the result of interactive tracking where uh, each of the axons have been labeled and the center lines have been drawn for each of the axons. And using these results and using uh, the level source approach, we have segmented all of the axons, which is shown in the last figure. Well, here, you can see uh, you can see the interface for the axon tracker 3D. Um, here, here we have a render window where, uh, as soon as the user loads the data, uh, it is shown in 3D. And then um, here you can see all the axons have been traced. The uh, the nice thing about this is that the user can actually visualize the tracking process as it is going on, so he can um, he or she can see. Um, how this process is being done, and if, in case uh, there's any problem, he can stop it at any given point of time and correct it if he wants to. This can also be visualized using, um, using cross-sectional views. So uh, the user can correct the points here, uh, delete, add, or also verify the tracking process. So he can play back the whole tracking process and see if it is, if it is correct or not. And the current version of the uh, axon tracker that we have um, uses about one minute per axon. That's the execution time uh, that it takes right now. <coughs> and uh, last and foremost, the stitching process. So once, uh, once the axons have been tracked in all the data sets, uh, now the process, uh, now, now the step is to put them all together and find the big picture. So there are two ways of doing this. One is in 2D and 3D. Uh, if, we, if we try the 3D method, there's a lot more points to search to find 
to find the alignment point. So what we did was to use a two-dimensional approach. We take the MIP image and we match them together in the XY domain first. And then uh, after this is done, we, we align them in the Z direction. So this improves the execution speed. So finally, uh, here's an example of, uh, of 30 different data sets. Uh, they have been, they're contiguous and uh, they have been aligned together using the correlation method. And uh, using Exxon Tracker, we can, um, given the complexity of the image, we can still track um, and label each individual axons here and find the center lines and segment them. It looks something like this. So uh, in this image, uh, each, each one of them have been labeled. And um, so said, uh, after this, I would like to conclude by saying that uh, this is a new software which we have on our website and it's, uh, anybody can try it. So uh, this software can be used to, uh, to label individual axons in, in, the, in the montages. And uh, this information could be used for either segmentation for, uh, for the visualization purpose or can be used for modeling or for studying the spatial uh, patterns of these axons, uh, how they exhibit that. And uh, for the future versions of, of the software, what we have planned is to parallelize the algorithm by using uh, techniques like multi-threading to improve the execution speed some more. And uh, to develop algorithms for automatic branch detection because uh, the current version of the software, uh, it's done manually. Uh, manually, the, the branch points have been identified. And also to reduce the manual intervention needed without uh, compromising accuracy. So uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues at the Methodist Hospital and also uh, our collaborators at the University of Houston, Stanford, and Harvard University. I'd like to thank you all for your attention. This is interesting work. Um, so the question is that, so for the data set you just showed, um, for the entire process, the automatic part plus the manual part, so how long that, does that take? Um, for the whole data set? Or? Yeah, for the entire thing. Um, I would say it would One take- One day or two day or five day or 10 days, something like that? With, with the manual um, intervention about each day, we, would, we were able to process about 10 to 15 data sets. So uh, each one of them had um, 20, 25 different axons. So the whole, whole uh, data set would take about a week, a week or two. A week? Yeah. All right. Uh, stick your results, Steedo's you results, you have to make sure that each tile is traced correctly, right? Uh, I'm sorry? When you try to stitch your tiles, uh, you have to make sure that each tile uh, is traced correctly. Each tile is traced correctly, yes. So you use manual uh, checking to make sure that you did this right? Yes. You can, uh, you can either do that so using... stitching is pretty simple then, because um, if each tile you have some even minor errors, Stitching be becomes a uh, li little bit tricky. Uh, the stitching is not done um, after the tracking. I mean, it can be done beforehand, and you can align. Uh, the tracking process, yes, there will be some differences where the starting point is. So, for example, um, so for, for example, if we have uh, the, the starting point here, and there might be some differences um, in, at the ending point of the data set, the previous data set, and the beginning of this point. But they can always be connected and smoothed out. Uh, the stitching is done based on the intensity, not, on the, not based on the tracking results.